My name is uh, Craig Madsen. I own a business called Healing Hose. And uh, from my background, I, I've been started a business back in 2002. And so I've been working using goats for vegetation management work since then. I, for that, I worked for the Natural Resource Conservation Service as a range management spe specialist, working with landowners on pasture and, and grazing planning and, and that aspect. And also I've got uh, been involved in uh, holistic management and training people about holistic management is a decision-making process to help people make uh, decisions and better decisions about their the whole they're managing. And uh, as part of that, I've worked with an organization called Roots Resilience. And we're putting out, just for your information, we're putting out a conference in March of uh, 2019. It's going to be in Pendleton. And it's uh, going to have Gabe Brown, who does a lot of work on regenerative agriculture in the North, uh, North Dakota, and then Temple Grandin, who's doing a lot of work with, uh, she's autistic, but, and, but she works on designing livestock uh, systems and how to manage livestock and the livestock handling. So both of those, like I said, those are flyer up here about that and an opportunity for people that may want to be interested in learning a little more about holistic management and also how uh, regenerative agriculture. And so, let's just get that started with that. And as, as we go through this, if you give you, people have questions, just raise your hand and we'll talk about them as we go. Questions, that, kind of do question and answers as we go and it, we'll have some time at the end as well to answer questions. But uh, first question I have, I guess, is how many people own goats? Oh, God. What's that? <laughs> what does that mean? Maybe so? Planning for spring. Okay, planning for spring. Okay. Oh, how many do have, live, have livestock? Somebody, okay, some of them don't have livestock. Okay. So I was just, uh, just going to get a, kind of an idea of what people are thinking. Uh, and why am I doing this talk? Well, I, this last year, I say I've been doing this for about 16 years, and this last year has probably been the um, year that I've had more requests for doing using the goats than I've ever had in the past. Uh, so I think there's, a, there's definitely an opportunity, and, I, and I'm not a person that wants to get into having, my, having a whole bunch of employees and, and doing that part of it. So I'd rather see somebody else get started on doing the business and I to help, help them get started doing something like this, if that fits in with, within what the person wanted to do. So I, I see there's an opportunity to, for doing that. Uh, I say there's uh, a couple reasons I think there is, because people, People, the use of goats has been going on for, well, thousands of years, but uh, be more aware of that tool as an option uh, in, in urban as well as rural areas. And then with the more regenerative agriculture going on, you see more people looking at cover crops and, and some of those kind of things that are going on in, on the cropland, and they're looking for ways to, to incorporate that, that cover crop. So I think livestock is another option for doing that versus tillage or or uh, just uh, mowing it. So I think there's a, an opportunity there for, depending on where a person wants to fit into that, that niche. Um, so I'm gonna go and then kind of talk about, uh, is this opportunity for you and go through a little process that we use to make the decision about starting a, our business and then talk a little bit about business planning. Um, so those kind of the areas we'll cover as we go through this. First thing is a little bit about our business, what we do, and. How, I say I started back in 2002, and before that, uh, I didn't, I've never had, we grew up on a, on a small beef operation, we had cattle, we never had goats. So first thing was, so back in about 2000, uh, 1999, looked at, okay, do I even, there was a lady that made a presentation about using goats, it was in California, they were doing a lot of vegetation management work, and they used a lot of, in, in that area for reducing fuels for fire risk. And, and uh, so it looked like there was an opportunity, but I saw the first thing we do was bought three goats. So I started out with three goats. So that's mm -hmm. just to see if I, goats and I got along. If I, you know, it's like, okay, do I like goats? <laughs> do I want to work with goats? So that's where I started with that. And then we got, and it kind of built from there. Uh, and goats are interesting animals. They're fun animals to be around. They could be challenging because of that. They're just really curious and, and fun that way. But so I went from three animals to now I have over 200. To top, this year I had a little over 300 head. And, so I, the, this is the vehicle I use, the semi, I have a semi and a double deck trailer that I use to haul all the animals around to in different locations. What's that? Well, when I started, we, if I did, when I just had three, I, I, I was just doing things at home. And then my friend and I expanded from that. We, he was wanted to use some goats on his place for uh, weed management, just for his own work management on his own property. So. 
we got, got this person who was selling out. We got about, I think about 60, 70 goats. I just used a, a, a horse trailer, you know, it was a five, about 20, 25 foot horse trailer, uh, gooseneck horse trailer, and pulled it around with that. So uh, it just been, and that's kind of as we went through the process of deciding, that's where we started, and we kind of went through a process, like say the holistic management process of looking at, now we'll go through that a little bit more, but looking at what, what size do we want to be that fit our, our size and our operation and what we wanted to do. Um, and, you know, what kind of opportunities, what kind of work we do. Uh, this is over in western Washington. I do a lot of work over in western Washington. Uh, spend probably two or three months over there. Uh, I have about a five months. Part of the process we went to is how long we're going to be on the road, and that was about five months was kind of what we decided was fit our, fit our uh, lifestyle and what we wanted to do. So I spent a lot of time over in western Washington. This is on a golf course, actually, on the edge. They've got these out areas uh, where they're trying to manage the blackberries and vegetation on these out areas, so we used the goats to come in and, and, and uh, help them reclaim some of those areas. They're trying to get them some, some of the areas will probably kind of just mow on a regular basis or they'll do some planting in those sites to keep the blackberries out. So that's kind of one spot. But one of the reasons we, and this is an area over, this is actually in Leavenworth, so in Leavenworth where we uh, was looking at Trying to do a little bit of work on the, the weak canary grass, trying to open up a di ditch area for to get better drainage. So uh, there's lots of different opportunities out there for different types of things, the type of work you want to do. And uh, and this is where I work a lot in Western Washington. You're working on some fairly steep slopes. Uh, fairly de uh, the one on the right is fairly dense blackberries. Uh, you're working on that kind of, that kind of terrain in there. And that's really, a, if you look, from that view, the building down there is Home Depot, and it's on is in Issaquah. So you're you're in areas where you've got you camping. I'm camping in urban urban sites, so it's kind of a funky way to, to do. But one of the reasons I worked started in Western Washington was it's easier. It was easier because they're looking for alternatives. For they don't want to spray, so they're looking for alternatives to uh, manage the vegetation on their property. So that was a fit. And also another thing was you wouldn't didn't have to convince them that your your management. Uh, because most people in Eastern Washington, that's why I, live, I just live out here in Lincoln County, so not too far from here, is that uh, in Eastern Washington people think, okay, if you're grazing their property, you should pay them because you're grazing, you're using their forage. And you're, so it's easy to convince there was somebody in East, Western Washington that I was providing the service, I was controlling their weeds, they used to paying for weed control and all that, so it was easier to convince them that they should pay me for my goats than somebody over here. But that's changing a little bit over here now. So that people are seeing that as more of a tool. And I, I get more requests over for Eastern Washington than I used to. And that, so that's, I think there's, there's an opportunity in, to do that in Eastern Washington. Especially because, again, I say there's organic, if you look at organic, some of the organic areas that we're trying to manage the weeds. Uh, you're looking at uh, kind of these cover crop issues with cover crops and those kind of things. So there's a niche there where you could potentially <coughs> fit in where goats would fit in, or sheep, or, or even ca and cattle potentially could go into those sites. But in areas we typically do, uh, again, this is in uh, Issaquah Highlands, which is for a homeowner association that we're working. So we're working right, people, right against people's backyards. You're, you're right, you know, you're, and you get a lot of people chatting with you and talking to you. So they're doing, doing looking at steeper slopes. We typically, the, you know, it's one of the other parts of the discussion about where you're, what, what, how, where, what kind of projects you work on and what your, how you determine what, how much you can charge. Is really the how? What's your? What are the alternatives that can? Um, they have for al alternatives, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through this. But you know, on the steeper slopes, they don't. It's hard to get equipment on, and again, they don't want to necessarily spray. So you know, their alternative there is maybe a hand crew, and that's and comparing your goats to a hand crew. And we'll and again, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Is you're, you're competing against? You're trying to compete against equipment. You're gonna to have to, your price is gonna have to be a lot lower than if you kind of compete with a hand crew. Yeah. You know, it, it's just a diff, there's night and day difference there. So, and this is just an example of you know uh, before and after. Uh, as you do this, working on some of these projects, trying to think about you know you want to because you get fairly for a lot of rain, so you're trying to look at you don't want to leave bare ground on the, on the uh, site. So this we're putting a lot of eating a lot of material, but a lot of the material gets some of the grass gets put, pushed down. And you cover provide a good soil cover for that for that uh, uh, site, so you're, main, you're managing the weeds, putting the material down for co soil cover, and, and also feeding them 
throw microbes and maintain a good bigger soil. So those kind of things are going on consideration as you do work on projects. So. And you will get a lot of questions. I mean, that's that's part of uh, that's one. If you if you don't if you don't want to work in an urban site, if you don't like chatting with people, and I'm not the most out outgoing person, I get I get tired after. A while. <laughs> it's like that was a tough day. You know, working out, doing physical work, that's sometimes easier than talking to people because <laughs> it, it just uh, just it depends on your nature. You know, what's work and what's not. So it's kind of nice to have I have you know kind of a project where I'm working like this, and I have projects where I'm out and more out in the country and. That's kind of okay. I get to relax. So I can take a break. So, so those kind of things are your mental, mental <laughs> aspects of it. But then there's all, uh, opportunities. I think even around around here uh, for fuel reduction, uh, risk, fire risk issues. And this was a site where we were doing some of that. And also it was a, it was over in the, kind of along the Columbia Gorge. And it was they were trying to manage poison, uh, knock back poison oak, those kind of things. Uh, some uh, brush. Yeah, ghosts need poison oak, poison ivy, uh, but I'm one of the lucky persons that's like, okay, because yeah. some people are really very seriously affects people. I'm one of them, I guess, I know it's not, I can't figure out, I'm gonna find out if I'm one of the ones that don't get affected by it, and I guess I am, because I never didn't break out in a rash. So there are about 10 or 15 percent of the people that don't, are not affected by it, by it, and I guess I'm one of the lucky ones, because it was like kind of nice, because when I was working, then I wasn't sure what I was going to do. <laughs> it's like, Right, exactly. You don't want to have a pet. Yeah, I don't want to have your landowner. It's because the lady was really, that was the reason she wanted the goats there to try to knock back. Because she was, because if, if the dog was running out there and she would come up, the dog would want to go out and, you know, rub up against her. Not good, you know. You don't want to be petting the goat or, uh, or if you got milk goats, you probably wouldn't want to send them out there and then try to milk them. Because it, yeah, because he's going to impact you. So those are some of the things, you know, as far as our business, kind of a, a, a kind of an overview of kind of what we do and how we manage that aspect of what kind of the projects we work on. Um, and does this, and so this is kind of a question, does this opportunity fit what you want to do? I mean, you can go from, I mean, I get, quite, I get requests from people that want to do, a, you know, the backyard, they want to do a quarter acre, they want to do something that's pretty small, and I, I don't do those kind of projects, because I, I, when I take on the road, I have 200, 200 to 240 head with me, it, and so I don't do small projects. So it's, I, 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 usually there's a lady on, in the Western Washington that I kind of refer for those two, and uh, she does some of those. So it's kind of figured, okay, and then you go up, I mean, there's, uh, you look at some of the areas, and there's a friend of mine, he, Ray Holes, he, he was running four or 5,000 of the goats. He, ran, he had a big operation. He would take, you know, semi-loads of goats to projects. And, and if, then when you're doing that, that's a totally, that's a, you're on, I mean, you've got to figure out, when you looking at this, you've also got to know where the goats are when they're out, when they're not out on a project because you got to feed them. It's because they're not. You can't just stick them in the garage and wait till the time the next project. <laughs> and, that, and some of that challenge is with people. You get a phone call and they say, oh, "I want you to, you know, it's be a." Usually, I, a lot of times I'm booked up, starting to be booked up in March. And, oh, this year, I, this year I was booked up almost in February. I mean, for most of the season. So it. Um, you get a call in June and say, hey, I want you to go out, I want you to, you to be out there next week, do that. I got this project I want it done next week. Well, how about next year? <laughs> or, or, or maybe the fall, maybe I got an opening in September, or, you know, or something like that. So those, those are some of the challenges. People, people don't think ahead that, okay, it's just a service, you want to, you know, I can just, you can just bring them over, but you're, you're booked up. Uh, so that's part of the educational process too, is when you're working with people. So these are kind of things. Uh, the, you know, how big you want to get, the, uh, how, you know, when we talked about, when the, Sulani and I and my wife talked about, you know, being out on projects and things like that, how long do you want to be, because we don't have any children at home, so that made it easier for me to be gone, so we kind of figured, okay, what's, what's feasible, because there's a lady, uh, when I went, first went to a workshop, I, one of the other things I did when I started, before I started the business, I went to, there's a lady, Lainey Malmberg, who does, uh, just, she calls herself the goat gypsy, because she's on the road 24. 20 months, you know, 12 months out of the year. She's always moved uh, from project to project, starts down and, you know, like she'll work down in Arizona and then start work to follow the weeds. In the wintertime, she's down there and then follow the weeds north type of a thing. So I, I didn't want to do that, you know, because we we're kind of a set location and stuff. So we didn't didn't do that. But uh, it's, you do have to know where, you know, where the, where the goats are going to be. And, uh, and working in urban areas, you know, do you, are you comfortable working with people or, you know, some of those things that you're looking at and, and also, because uh, I know, not all goats are the same. 
<laughs> so that's one of the things, experience, the go there's experienced goats, you know, about, there's experienced goats for eating vegetation, you know, certain types of vegetation, you'll go to a spot, oh, my goats won't eat that. Well, they've probably been fed hay all their life, you know, alfalfa, and they've been in to go to hay bin all their life, so that's all they know. They don't know that they can eat this other stuff. So experienced goats is, is important, and then as far as eating vegetation, and experienced goats are also important for the noises there you're going to be exposing them to. Because if you go to urban, if they're just being out, you know, out in the country and it's nice and quiet, and you go to an urban area where there's, you know, ambulance going by, helicopters going over, a train going by, it changes, you know, it's like, oh, what the heck is that, you know? So I, you got to understand that, that there's a training involved in that. You don't, because I know the first time a helicopter went on, I didn't know the goats were going to stop on my fence before they, you know, <laughs> you just hope they stop before they go through my fence. So those kind of things, but it, you know, so this is kind of, the next part of this is kind of going into the holistic management decision making process a little bit to cover that just to kind of give you a kind of thought process of maybe how to look at this as an opportunity and uh, it's kind of what we use to do kind of evaluate what we wanted to do as far as applying our business. So. And then, so what's your passion? What do you want to do? What do you, what do you really enjoy? What you want to accomplish? And what's really important to you uh, is actually a part of that. And then. You know, so a key part of that is also being making enough money to make it financially viable. And so you got to be able to understand what, what is you need to make to make it worth your while. And then what is, and then how, especially if you own your own land, how are you going to manage that? But also the other people's land, how are you going to make sure that you're, you're moving them in a direction that they, and know what their expectations are if it's their land so that you can move them in the right direction, not going in the wrong. And the same way with your own land, make sure that your decisions you're making are moving in toward what you're trying to create. And this was a, just an example. This was Issaquah Highlands, and the, the site was, it was really hard to, you couldn't really get, hard to get the goats, the goats, well, the goats didn't mind going upstairs, but we moved them up. So it's hard to get equipment in there, so we just ran the stores, goats up the stairs, and just kind of fenced on both sides, up the stairs, and yeah, goats love to climb, that worked fine. So, so how, we, how we get to, you know, creating your vision depends on how you make the decisions, and, and also the really, what, in what context those decisions are made. And so it's important to understand where we're going. And, and this is kind of conventors, conventional decision making where we're making decisions based on a, a certain objectives that we're trying to accomplish. And you're, they take all the influence, you take all the you know, advice, peer, peer uh, experience or advice from consultants, you take all that information to, to make that decision. And one of the things I like about wholesale management is one of the key parts we'll talk about most conventionally, decision, when you make a decision, you assume you're right. Well, sometimes we're not. A lot of times we're not. So that is a key part of that. And, how we, and so human creativity is a big part of it. And, that is, and like I tell people, you know, you don't, as far as projects for the goats, you're really only limited by your creativity. What pro, kind of work on the goats work is really about based on what kind of projects you do and those kind of things. So it's really limited by what you think is possible. Because they can go places that you don't think is possible. Then you've got to figure out how to put the fence up keep them where you want. But, so in the holistic decision making process, it really adds to, it doesn't take away from that process, those, that information. It adds really a, a, your content. What's your vision? What you're trying to attain? What you're trying to accomplish? That, it adds that component to it and kind of the whole under your managing. And you put, and then you evaluate those decisions towards that context. So that's kind of the, the holistic management process. And one of the challenges that we get, you know, why, why, where does it work best is we deal with com complex systems. I mean, you look at the environment, you look at the business, you look at, they are, uh, you know, environment, especially self-adapting. If you change one thing, if you take out, if one plant disappears, another plant comes in. Whereas like, for example, this computer, if it, the hard drive goes bad, it's not gonna change. You just recall, we place the hard drive, we're on. It's not gonna self-adapt, so. That's a complicated, computer's complicated, but complex systems when you're dealing with environment and stuff like that are, are self-adapting and changing. So you need, you need a system that is able to take, deal with that complexity. Um, and that's where you get the holistic context. And background on holistic management. If you, uh, I've went to training through for, for holistic management through Alan Savory and there's a new, new book that's out, that it's really 2016, Holistic Management, it's published, the third edition is, was published in 2016, and it has, a, it has all this background. And it's a good book, good read, it talk, you know, it gets connection. That's what really relate, ra raised my level of awareness about 
what I want to do, because I was working for the next day when I was back, working for the Natural Resource Conservation Service, working for the federal agency. My wife said, comes home, and we had we talked about this much, but my wife, you know, you come home grumpy and not happy, and you know, so we, so we looked at ways that, I, that was not fit for me anymore, so we're trying to figure out what's next and, and, and what, what would make, what would, what would, and we went through the process of treating a holistic context and what's important to us, what we value, and it helped us to guide us. And this is kind of, okay, why are we talking about elephants? But this is kind of just the context of how things, how we deal with complicated, uh, complex systems. This was in Zimbabwe, and that's where Alan Savory was, and he lived in, that's where he lived for quite, quite a few years. He was a wildlife biologist in, in, in Zimbabwe. And there was a situation where they were doing, uh, it was, they were creating wildlife reserves. And there were people, you know, people were living along the river, uh, along the Zambezi River, and they were going to put, oh, we're going to put this wildlife, whatever, in, we can't have people in the wildlife area, because they're not part of the system. So we got to take the people out. So they took the people out. Well, they, when the people, and then, what the, then the elephants come in, and they just, they just trash the, the, you know, they, they were just camped along the river then, because they didn't have any pressure to push them out. People, there were people there making noises and, and, and doing activities. So it's like, okay, we took out one component, and we didn't get, so we had an unintended consequence was that now the, the, the elephants are sitting on, along the river and just t destroying trees and eating all the vegetation. So they say, huh. But, so it's one of those things where we're doing, we do it with complex systems. One, doing one thing and have totally different, unrespected results that we didn't think it was going to happen. So, and then this is kind of defining your whole under management. These are really three components. The decision makers, who are, the, who are decision makers, what is your resource base, and what's the money you have available? And these decision makers are the people that make everyday decisions and, and also who can veto that decision. So it's like for our whole under management, just Sue Arnie and I, my and my wife, we're the main decision makers for that purpose. And the resource base is what assets you have available. Do you have land? Do you have... Uh, you know, equipment, you know, somebody's talking about trailers, what kind of trailer, you have, you have existing equipment and trailer, and you have, maybe have goats that you want to use, so those are the resource base that you have available to you, and then customers and, and uh, you know, or people that, uh, that you influence and who influence, who influence you for, so our resource base includes, you know, our neighbors or our, our grandchildren, so those are aspects that are important to us as part of that process. And then the other part of that is money. What resource money do you have available? Do you have money available or do you have debt, you know, loans available, potential loans? So those are things that you're, that defines your whole. And then your context is, the other part of it is what is, the, what are you really wanting to come, what is, like that vision, what is you really, what's really important to you, what do you value? And the future resource space is, we're going to talk about that. It's really, it's called that. What is, what is important to you? What, you know, why am I talking about this and when you go opportunity? This is just ways of thinking through, is this go to opportunity? I mean, anything you do, whether it's a go to opportunity enterprise or another thing you're trying to add to your operation or try to start as a business, does it fit what you're trying to accomplish? And I think that some people, we get lose track of that and then we start something, that, oh, this is gonna be wonderful and it's gonna be great. But you start it and maybe it doesn't work, you know, it doesn't work out. But so, because you don't have, you know, writing those things, writing these things down and looking at these seriously before you start, start thinking about a new enterprise. And I can say, if anybody wants to, you know, the PowerPoint, just give me your email and I can email this to you. So, um, and what's, what's values are important to you? You know, what do you want to accomplish? What are the most important things to you? You know, our, you know the grandchildren, we got to make sure they fit into this. We have time for them and, and, uh, you know, how you want, what, how you want to see those relationships. And, and then you're always monitoring because I can tell, it's like, this year, or last, some years I don't take a break in, in August. I mean, I, why one year I did, and last, this last year I didn't, and then this year I, I get this monitoring, you know, monitoring those social aspects. And, you know, your wife says, you probably should come home in August. <laughs> you probably should come home in August. You know, it's like, you know, I want to break, because you manage the animals at home. And, and so it's like, so we take, you know, you monitor those things. And, and, you know, it's not all about the money side of things. It's about managing those relationships as well. So, um, and then part of that is your community. What kind of ties in the community you want to be, and where you want to be living, and what resources do you need available to, to be successful for your business to be successful? And so, how do you? When we're involved in the community, we we are volunteer firefighters and those kind of things. So we want to be, you know, potential be opportunity. Um, 
And this is their future resource base. What does the land have to look like for you to, in order to, to produce the quality of life you want to? And that's where we're looking at our land, how we're going to try to manage that land to, to, uh, to, be, to be as productive as, as possible, and also other people, help the other people manage their land to be as, uh, it's going to be re regenerative, we've got enhancing the land resource base versus not. So, and then those, how do you want to be perceived by your clients and neighbors? And, you know, you want to be, there are other people that do this type of business, especially on the west, west side, and there are a few that don't have their business, um, the type of how they manage their business, they don't always treat their clients real well, and it, it gets around, <laughs> especially in a small, small, I mean, uh, there's not that many of us, so. So this, in our context, is kind of a visual, con visual holistic context, we have my wife and I, and these are my grandson and granddaughter. So those are important, you know, important relationships that we want to maintain. And then that's part of our, our property that we own, this out, like I say, just a little ways west of here. That we're trying to, we just bought some more acreage, and we're, it's been conventionally farmed, so we're looking at ways of restoring that back to, uh, you know, improve the soil health and using the animals and, and, and those things to restore that back to where we want. So we've got a vision for where, where we're headed, and, and we make decisions based on that vision. And then you want to, it's always, and when you're doing your whole list, it's not what, it's, you're not how to, or you don't put how to's in there, it's just what you want. You know, I don't, I didn't put in our whole list context, it's not, I want to raise goats, I want to do, I want to, it's more, I want to work outdoors, I want to work in an environmental situation. So it's not specific things, and you evaluate those, you evaluate whether the goats fit into your context. And, you, and it's always, you know, if you don't write it down, it, it's important to write it down and have everybody's, and, if you have more than one person that, you know, if you have a wife and I, all their, each uh, characteristic, each person's uh, input is as valuable as the other. So it's no, they're not be ranked. And, and you're looking at trying to create, the, you, you're not, go, you're tra tra what are you trying to create, not what you're trying to go against. So it's all this aspect. And there's uh, uh, questions that you use to help you guide you through. Because one of the things you're trying to look at is you're trying to make sure that your decisions you're making are environmentally, socially, and, uh, Environmentally, uh, you know, environmentally, socially, and, and financially sound decisions. So it's looking at you get that big picture. And one of the things that also assumes you're wrong, <laughs> which you conventionally does. A lot of people, you know, you make, uh, I always get frustrated when people are making policies. Okay, we got the policy done, it's in there, it's done, we're done, and it's done, and it's not, you know, because there's going to be unintended consequences. You need to deal with complex systems. So, um, and then you're always evaluating, when you make the decisions, you're evaluating those towards your holistic context. And is this moving you towards that holistic context? And these are these are seven questions. I'm not gonna. I'm going We'll touch on a couple of these as I we go. Touch on a couple of these a uh, little in more depth as we go into some of the business side side of the uh, starting thinking about starting the, this kind of a business. We'll cover those a little more in depth. I'm just gonna cover them briefly. Um, this is a big as a if you're dealing with an issue, a weed problem or something like that, cause and effect. You know, understanding the root cause of the problem. Any type of problem is key. Because a lot of times we're dealing with symptoms. If you look at, uh, if you spray a weed, that's the, the weed's a symptom. You spray it, you're, not, you're just dealing with the symptom. So you gotta figure out why is it there? What's, what's going on with that? What's, you know, a lot of issues, a lot of times we're dealing with the symptom and not the root cause of the problem. And that is, because that causes huge problems if you're doing it that way. And this is a really a key one as far, especially when you're dealing with, uh, there's, really three weak links and one's social, one's financial, one's biological. We'll talk a lot more about the financial one. But the social one also comes into play. If, some, if you're, something you, I mean, I, um, you know, will cause, will this, this action cause anger, confusion, or is there's gonna be a lot of peer pressure. Some, I've, you know, I've kind of, I'm in an area of conventional agriculture, kind of this year I planted, you know, a diverse uh, crop, uh, we have 20 acres, it's got 20, about 15 acres. I planted a really diverse uh, cover crop, uh, so I'm sure my neighbors are thinking he's crazy. <laughs> so, you know, does peer pressure bother you? You know, sometimes peer pressure is a major influence on people's decisions, so. But, and it's always, when you always want to address, make sure you're addressing the weak link first. And that, and we'll talk, like I say, we'll go into more depth on that in a little bit. And I'll go through exact. I'll go through example of this. So I'm not going to spend much time on it. This is a weak link financial, but I'll go through an exact example of how we do that for the gold side of it, and a little bit here. Uh, marginal action. This is really essentially getting the best bang for your buck. You know, dollar return for dollar. 
uh, invested or time invested looking at two or more options. You know, if you're looking at the goat, you know, you're looking at you know decision related to the goats, or you're looking at uh, you know you want to start meat goats, or you want to start you know the vegetation management side of it, looking at two more options. Which one does actually move you towards your holistic context and, and greater and more motion? And gross profit again, we'll go. This is comparing two or more enterprises, and we'll go into kind of a little more in depth on this one. Energy, money, source, and use. This is really kind of ties back into where's the money? What's the source of the money? Does it tie in with your holistic context? Is it something that, like for example, of spraying the weed? You know, if you got to repeat it over and over and over again, that's kind of an addictive process. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's not necessarily a good thing. So it's kind of trying to figure out how that you know something's used and how it, uh, how is the money used? Is it used in a way that generates more income or is it something else? So. And sustainability is, is this action move you towards your holistic context. And the last one is essentially gut feeling. You know, it's society and culture. How do you feel about these, after you run it through all those testing quotes, how do you feel about this decision? And this is one of the, one of the key ones. That if you don't get anything else out this, this is probably one of the key ones to do, is, is really <laughs> monitor. Whether biological, financial, or social, you're always monitoring and understanding what uh, you know, there's somebody, yesterday I went to one where they were talking about le where, how to get, you know, leasing land or, or acquiring land. And one it's, commu you know, communication was one that came up all the time. It's about if you're, you're leasing land from a landowner and you got to lease and you may have a lot of things specified in that, but it's that, are you monitoring that relationship on a regular basis, on a monthly basis to understand it? Because one, one guy talked about, well, there's one, he's leasing some land to one guy Two, two different people. One guy's managing the weeds along the along the edge of his field, and the other guy's not. So that bugs him a little bit that nobody's not managing the weeds. So it's understand, getting the, understanding that's going on early enough that it doesn't eventually come into something that causes a problem down the road. So if you do a year later, the guy's pissed off because you never touched, got the weeds along the, you know. The, so it's understanding that and monitoring that is important, and that's where the you're looking at the whole aspect of that. And then it's really you look the monitoring. You're looking for the Earliest possibility is something going wrong. Uh, you know, on social, it's those relationships. On, on, are you managing land and grazing landscapes? It's really, uh, it's really looking at uh, the soil surface. You know, but yeah, if you're driving a car and you, you run out of gas outside of dusty, oops, you weren't probably watching the gauge, gas gauge. So that wasn't the early monitoring. <laughs> you wasn't watching for the early morning signs. So, so those kind of things are important. And the feedback loop is really the. Uh, part of it. You're planning it, you're monitoring, you're adjusting, you're controlling, adjusting that plan as needed to get you on the direction towards your holistic context. And you can, it really helps you improve management, increases your level of awareness of what's going on within the business, whether it be financially or socially, those relationships with customers, with people in your, con your whole, uh, and all it helps. And it does help increase profitability because you're looking at your sp expenses in a different way. So what is your holistic you know, understand your holistic context and how does it fit within your. So now we're going to switch gears, and you got to get organized. You got to get the gut dog out, Bordy Collie out there, out there to get us organized to think about the plan. And so, there's really when you're doing a, a business plan, there's really three legs to a business plan. One's the financial, one's the uh, direct production, and one's the marketing. And nobody's good at all. Nobody is good at all three of those. Somebody's good at two. I mean, I do the. A lot, of produce, a lot of farmers are good at the production side. I like to go out there and work with the animals. I want to do this, and great. But not me. And I do pretty good on the financial, but marketing, I'm getting better at the marketing side of it. You, but if you don't have those three legs in place, you're not going to have a successful business. Because if, if, I mean, I, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go into the, one of the testing guidelines. So we're going to look at these three kind of testing guidelines related to the um, the goat business. And, you know, when you're doing the ghost profit analysis, it, it looks at evaluating uh, the income and expenses for that particular enterprise. So you got the goat enterprise, you would look at only those ex expenses that are variable expenses related to that. So there's ex the, fix the ones you don't allocate, they're all the overhead expenses. If you had land, the expenses related to, I should probably do that too. Oh, I, turn my, I haven't got a phone call yet. But. Um, all the expenses related to that are fixed, like land costs. If you have a trailer, that's a fixed expense already, so you don't put that in there. So all the if you got if you have somebody that you hire already, 
that uh, just is there available for resources, that's a fixed cost. So none of those go into determining how, how viable that altern this alternative. You just look at all the variable costs, the things you have not spent yet. If you don't have, you want to go up to 100 head of goats and you got only got five because the expense associated with acquiring those additional goats would be a variable expense. You'd, you know, kind of amortize that over a period of time. But it's, so you're looking at evaluate, you want to evaluate, you know, think, and don't allocate the, the expenses that are, are, that are fixed. And these some exa more examples of fixed costs, you know, the land payments, equipment payments, labor, so all those would be fixed. I mean, you could sell the equipment if that's something did, but typically you would, those are assets, that, you, that would be the assets you have available to, to start your enterprise. So this is a good way of evaluating uh, how good, of, how much money you could make. This is only looking at the financial side of it, the, how much money you can make on that, that aspect. And one of the things that, it's kind of maybe not that, it's really trying to think about things a little differently, shift your mind about how you look at profitability. There's a lot of time you go, okay, the income minus expenses equal profit. Well, no. You really want to look at it a different way. You want to shift that and say profit. My, well, I'm, I'm going to set my profit ahead of time. I know what I want, how much I want to make, I want to do. And so if that's income minus expenses. So you don't, because you don't determine at the end of the year that you're profitable. You determine that at the beginning of the year that you're profitable. So how do you make that happen? What do you do to make that happen? You don't, you, know, you don't look at the end of the year and say, oh, okay, I guess I was made some money. You want to make sure you're making money as you go along. And, mo and, be mon and this is one of the key things you want to monitor. And how do you, you know, people ask, okay, how do you determine what the charge for like, the goat rental business and those kind of things? Uh, how, much, you know, how, much, you know, how much profit do you want to make? You know, it's, it's what is it? So one way of doing it is, what do you have to make to make it viable operation for you? You know, is it you want to make, uh, you know, what kind, of, what, kind of, what kind of hourly wage do you want to make? You know, okay, I want to make thirty dollars an hour on my amount of projects. Kind of thing. But, but again, you got to go make sure that okay, that type. You got to make sure you evaluate how much, you know your land land costs are in there, your equipment costs, places for keeping those animals. You got to feed hay. You know, a certain portion of the year. You got to keep track. Of that cost makes sure you're covering all your costs uh, and your labor. Paying yourself is part of that cost because a lot of people, oh, it's this, this, this. But labor, you're you're paying yourself is a, you know a profit and important and don't you don't want to and you want to pay yourself a reasonable amount amount because you mean you look at you go down to a mechanic how much he's going to charge you an hour probably about eighty to hundred bucks an hour for a mechanic so I mean. Maybe you don't think you want to pay 100 bucks now. I think that to my time, my, my experience, my time experience is worth 30 to 50 bucks now, you know, whatever. You know, you just figure out what you think is reasonable for your, and don't, you know, it's not, you know, most, well, minimum wage is almost, they're trying to push me anyway at $15 an hour. So that's minimum. So I'm at least, I'm at least two or three times worth more than that. So, <laughs> so those kind of things to think about when you're, when you're trying to determine income. And the other one is what is your alternative? You know, what, do alternatives cost? So if you're, if they, you know, it's how much I can charge in Eastern Washington is, is different than I can charge in Western Washington. Because again, not of Eastern Washington, they, they'll, they're not, they're, they don't mind, you know, uh, spraying herbicides. Also, you look at the land value in Eastern Washington, the land value in Western Washington, huge difference. I mean, two to three thousand, you know, somebody you get some of the, Residential, you get to the residential, you're probably five to ten thousand dollars an acre. In East, Eastern Washington, you get on the west side, it's a hundred thousand dollars an acre, or maybe more. So it's not, it's my, it's, it's a night, day and night difference in, in the value of, of land. Um, so that, and it's, it's just more expensive to live over there. So you take that into consideration. Also, your, your risk is higher in Western Washington because you're doing, I'm doing projects. You know, behind houses, you're in urban area settings, so those kind of factors you take in. And if you're doing steep slopes, what you know, can they use equipment on that? Difficult. I mean, a certain equipment could you could mow that, but it's it's, it's more specialized. A hand crew. I know the, this is a homeowner association in Musical Highlands, and he did some figuring because they had they, if they brought a hand crew in, that they would trip it off with uh, you know weed whackers, and then they had to you know rake it to move because they wanted they didn't want to leave that all that dry material on the surface that they were going to remove that. 
it was, you know, it was, they were charging, they figured it cost them six to eight thousand dollars an acre. I can beat that. <laughs> I can put, I can charge a lot of money, you know, I can charge two to three thousand dollars an acre and, and, and beat that and make good money. I mean, that's probably eight hundred, you know, roughly eight hundred dollars. I can charge eight hundred dollars a day for the good life or the goats being on that piece of ground. So, it's uh, so it's looking at what the alternatives are and what's what's available to. If you're trying to do just you know, if you make uh, I get a call and it, it's flat and it's well you, you can mow it you can mow it quicker than I can ever do it with your goats. So I can never beat I'm not gonna beat mowing. I'm not gonna, I'm not competing against mowing because that's not my niche because I do you know you got steeper slopes you have softer sites so so you're not you got to be thinking about that as you look at uh, alternatives and and. Uh, and possibilities of where you want to, you know, how much you can charge on some of these sites. Uh, and in uh, income, we always want to be on the conservative side because uh, it can get you in trouble. Because one of the key, one of the biggest problems is cash flow because you can get yourself in trouble. If you can't pay your bills, you're in trouble. So you want to have, you know, have some, when we started the business, we, Sue and I had started her, uh, kind of went out of her, her own, and she, so we'd built up some savings that we knew we had savings and adequate that we could start. I could start starting a new business. One of the positive next challenge, positive things now is that there's there's more demand. There's more demand out because when I started, I had to create the demand. Now there's demand out there, so it's not you don't have to. The leg time is not as great as it was when I was trying to get it done. So that is not as, it's not as critical, but it's still important. Expenses, you know, we tend to see, one of the challenges with uh, we tend to let expenses creep up over time and so that's where it's really critical that you monitor your expenses and that's where you put that profit first you're paying yourself first and you do that you monitor, you monitor, you monitor your expenses on a monthly basis and and you evaluate what what those because you have there's there's wealth building expenses and there's just maintenance expenses so maintenance expenses are expenses that you know maintain the current level of income you know you gotta you gotta feed the animals you gotta Fit, repair the, you know, the vehicle, you gotta do those things. So what your wealth building expenses, that's where this comes into play. Your, your weak link, your chain, of, your financial weak link. And you have the resource conversion. This is where, in most, if this, you're applying this to a pasture situation, it would change this a little bit, but I'm just tying this to the business. So this is really your knowledge, skills, and abilities. You know, what your knowledge of managing animals, your knowledge of uh, what plants are poisonous, that plant-animal interaction. And I had a lot of uh, knowledge about with my background in rain management. I knew kind of the plant-animal interaction. You know, uh, you know, I knew the poisonous plants because I did a lot of plant ID. So I had that, you know, the sculpt, the, the knowledge. And but then your your product. So you look now. You then you look at the other part, the product version. You have you, you, your goats, your equipment, and those kind of things that you're trying to to, to put in place. And then the, the marketing is your clients, you know, how, who, what kind of clients do you have to, so if you're back here where you're not, you're at resource conversion, I don't have, you know, understanding of the plant animal interaction or what my, exactly what my, those goats are going to eat, what plants are poisonous, you might have want, want to put your money and energy into, into getting that skill built up. But if you have that knowledge, I don't I got 10 goats, well, you can start some projects with 10 goats, but my vision is to, you know, I want, that's limited by, I can only do so much. It makes a moment income with ten go. So I need to have more. I'm mean, not getting more demand for. I've got clients that want me to do work, but I only got ten goats, and they can only cover a little bit of time. You know, that's when we started out with seventy goats and started doing projects. It's like uh, seventy goats can only cover this much space in this amount of time. I can only charge really this much. If I'm going to make more money, I'm going to have more. I have to go more goats so I can make more. So I can. Uh, you know, have, cover more ground more quickly. So I put the money, our weak link to that thing was the number of animals that we had. And then, then it was, okay, we got these animals, now I gotta do some marketing. So once I address, okay, I got more animals, then I, my problem is I gotta make sure, I, ha I got, now my weak link is marketing, because I have gotta make sure I have enough clients to keep those goats busy to, keep, to make me, so you're always thinking about what's your weak link, because you always have one. And where, where is it, and where, so that, you, that, that, that becomes a wealth generating expense. That's where you put the, your money into to enhance your profitability. And then, then the production side of things is, you know, how, you got, you know, for the example, again, 10 goats, you want to, how, how big do you want, you want to plan for, you don't want to pit a build, if you're going to, oh, I'm going to, my future plan is to, you know, I'm going to 100, 100, we got, we carry, we raise about 100 does and, 
and a uh, kid kid out kid out about 100 does every year. And so we, you know, when we put up a facility, we want to make sure that facility would handle handle the number of animals that we wanted to grow into. You don't want to okay. I want to build up. I got ten goats. I want to build a building for ten goats. Well, if you're going to eventually get to 100 goats, that building becomes useless. I mean, except for maybe diesel or something else. So that is the challenging aspect you got to think about. Uh, where are they going to, in off season? Where are they going to be off season? You know, <coughs> ideally, if I had, you know, ideally would be find a place down in the basin to keep the goats, because then I, you know, you find a place where you could keep them out and they could graze most of the winter. And that's what you know when Ray Holes had the five thousand head of goats. He he'd winter down at Umatilla and the you know all of that in the basin because he'd go out in irrigated circles, not much snow. They're out grazing the majority of the year because you can't afford to feed that many animals hay. Uh, we say, well, we're staying out here. We got we got to feed them hay for five, you know, four or five months out of the year. But we had cal we cal calculate that cost in the system. But that's quality life. We're not. I don't want to go down there every day to the basin to check on goats. That's too far, too challenging. So we don't do that. So. And then learn, you know, you're learning how much, you know, is the how much area can your goats cover in a period of time? Which you know, what what do they eat? Do you, do you have experienced goats, or do you need to? Um, and there is a manual out there, a target grazing manual, which is a great resource that provides lots of information about the types of. Uh, it talks about contracting. It talks about the impacts of using animals on different types of weeds and those kind of things. So it's a really good resource. And then market plan. Where, where's, where are your clients? What do you want to do? What kind of do you want to work in the urban areas? You just want, to, or you want to work in just locally and those aspects. So, what, what's important to you as far as client? You know, what, where's your focus at? You know, what type of clients? How are you going to reach them? You know, I, now I have, a, I have a website, and word of mouth is primarily my. You know, if you're trying to go into a new area, you may want to do some ads and do some things like that. Uh, do you want to? Do you need a contract, or are you going to do it? hand safe basis. A lot of times, even if you can do it with small private landowners, let's say I know the person real well, I do a, a small contract. Right? So you have that understanding uh, of when are you going to get paid, what's your expect, and clear expectations of what, because you don't want it to look like it's been mowed. Well, it's probably not going to look like it's been mowed. You know, because you know, it's not going to be perfectly, you know, you're goats are not going to eat everything evil, like, even like a, a, you know, it's not going to mow it even like a machine. So you got to make sure you have clear expectations. I'm, I want you to eliminate, you know, the blackberry canes. I want those canes all gone. Well, they're not going to, the canes all gone. Well, the goats are not going to eat those canes that are eight, you know, an inch in diameter. They're going to be flattened and knocked down, but that they're going to still be there. So you got to make sure that they understand, they visualize, you know, show them pictures. I've got pictures on my website that they can visualize what they expect it to look like when it's done because you don't want to not meet their expectations. And then insurance, most, most places you work, uh, work for require. I mean, if you're looking for, um, oh, cities, municipalities, homeowner associations, all those usually require you to have uh, liability insurance. And sometimes, it, it, but most of the time, sometimes it's best, good to have it for your own protection. If something happens, you don't want to, you don't want to lose the farm. So it's important to make sure that you have your coverage. And then clients, I say, you know, the one on the far left is a, a project I used to do is out in the country. It was kind of my, my breather project because I'm way up in, the, up in the kind of the west side of the Cascade. So you're out there by yourself and there's only a couple of people come by. And so that's, you know, after you've worked in the city for a while, that's my, I'm going out and taking a break, you know. And my breather, my, uh, Mental ex my mental breather exercise. So or you can be in, like, say, in the, in the urban sites where you got lot, they're next to houses, and then there's the goats. That's over on the Range Ridge Island. That's the uh, Fort Ward. That's the old military, uh, those old gun, gun, gun places. That's what those are, those military gun places. But it's, now it's a park, so we're managing the uh, English ivy on those sites. So, I mean, you can do There's all kinds of opportunities out there for what you want to do and what you want to do. And then I'm going to throw in the last thing, you know, kind of the monitoring side of things. It's important that you uh, monitor. Um, and whether it be, you know, financial, again, you don't want to get those expenses to come up. And social, whether it's your, your relationship with the people within your context, it's in your own context, and also your clients are very important. Uh, final check. You know, it's just, it's just, uh, are, are you, is this a fit for your whole, your, your context, within your context? And, and just thinking about that as you work through a process where you're trying to think about adding a central uh, project, a new enterprise or a new, start a new business, 
uh, it's important to be thinking about those and how it fits in what's really important to you. Uh, and as I said, I think there's a, there's a growing demand in that, in that, uh, for that using go goats and sheep and cattle as a tool for vegetation work. Uh, and there's more, especially as you get you know, people looking for alternatives and we're trying to look at the alternatives working with nature, with nature and then regenerative, with the regenerative agriculture and looking at soil health, there, like I say, there's going to be more opportunities for people, more people planting cover crops and on the farm ground situation. They're looking at ways to incorporate those. And, and one of the ways to do that is with livestock. You know, and that, and sometimes, sometimes that situation is maybe cattle would work better, depending on the volume and material you're trying to work. But there's opportunities there for doing some interesting, uh, interesting work. And uh, some resources, I just I mentioned the Targeted Green Handbook and the Holistic Management. And, and if you're a person who's interested and has questions, you can get a hold of me. And I do have uh, a flyer about that, uh, that upcoming uh, workshop and a flyer and a car, my car business cards up here and a little flyer about we do, uh, do sell goats. I do provide some consulting uh, we, uh, as well. And uh, are there any people have questions? Yes. A few. Sure. Um, well, in terms of the scope of the opportunity, how many goat herders? What, what do you are you called goat herders? Goat. <laughs> yeah, you go. Yeah, I guess you go to use called a herd. Yeah. And uh, how many enterprises like yours are there, and what's the opportunity for more enterprises like yours? Um, I, I there in Eastern Washington, there's probably there's nobody else doing contract work. Well, as far as, I mean, there's people out there grazing. I mean, they have sheep and they, you know, they have large flocks of sheep and they're grazing, you know, stubble and those kind of things. But as far as contract work, there's, there's not somebody in Eastern Washington. I don't do much work in Eastern Washington. There's work on the West, there's more work out. We could probably, I don't know, we could probably have 30, you know, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of opportunities. I'm not sure the numbers, but there, there you could probably double, triple the number of people doing projects and you still have more work to do. And in terms of customers, is, I would think like highway departments and, and cities and yeah, cities and people. Highway. I've worked a little, done a little work with the highways, um, but they they usually have the ability to mow those sites and they spray, so they're not necessarily looking for an alternative. Some site, some locations maybe it's fit, but uh, I do work for um, King County Metro doing along their uh, parking rides and and some of those kind of things. But yeah, there's all kinds of uh, you know, cities. Looking at some of their, you know, parks, uh, uh, homeowner associated, private landowners that have ten acres that they moved out the country because they want to be out the country and they don't have a way of managing that because they have no animals. Uh, so how do you help manage their weeds or may maybe manage their fire risk? You know, expensive homes. There's some. I know over and I did a project a number of years ago over in uh, in, in Idaho, Coeur d'Alene, on uh, Cave Bay. It has a homeowner development in a in more forested areas, so they're trying to manage. They had came in there, we did a fire wise and reduced the trees, and knocked back the brush. But then they opened, of course, they once they open those sites up for the trees, once the brush, most of the brush are sprouters, what are they going to do? Boom, there comes the brush back because it's open. That's the sunlight coming in there, the brush is going to come back. Uh, great opportunity for goats to come in there and manage those sites. And just, um, yes, yeah. Where do you live when you're with your goats? I, what's that? Uh, I live over in, uh, in Edwall, uh, just a bit of ways west of you. Oh, when do I, where do I stay when you're on a project? The semi has a sleeper, there's a bed in there, and that, that's one of the reasons I got the semi too, because I forgot, okay, I can have a bed in the semi, and so I stay uh, kind of in the semi when I'm on a project. So that's my, that's where my, my spot. Yeah, it's a, oh, I was just going to say that I'm from Walla Walla, and the city actually uses those to clear the edges of the canals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. A friend did that project a number of years ago. Yeah, we kind of coordinated on that project. But yeah, cities. Yeah, those. Yeah, like say canals. I do work for for down by Dayton. They look at some of their levees because um, I'm on the levee work because they're responsible for maintaining those levees and trying to keep the uh, manage weeds, keep the brush down on levees and stuff like that. Another opportunity. So I have a bunch of questions. Okay. During the day, are you with them as well? So at night you're sleeping. But then are you monitoring them or do you go? Do it go? I, when, I, when I'm uh, out in urban areas, I, I'm there. I don't. Because there's a risk there with the animals getting out. And I've had, not, 
people can be nice, and then they can be people that are not so nice. Uh, you get bored teenagers, you don't want those. <laughs> fireworks, you don't want those either. Bored teenagers with fireworks don't work <laughs> around goats. So, uh, so I've had challenges with kid, uh, children, I mean teenagers mostly, that are just bored and they're trying to be mischievous. And, so you're there for that reason, and and and, and also to interact with the public because they. It helps them understand what you're doing because they still have a lot of questions, and it really helps them. I mean, you're really doing kind of outreach <laughs> as part of you know agriculture, educate education in urban areas. Okay, animals can be used as a tool to to have positive impacts on the environment, and try to show that as well. So that's an educational component of, of using the goats. So do you use electric fencing? Yes, I use electric netting. All of my uh, yeah, I use I use. There's, I bought a super mirror, premier one. They're got, it's got different heights and different sizes, but I use electric netting. So you're moving that fairly frequently? Yeah, every probably two to three days it's being moved. Yeah. Because one of the one of the positive sides of that aspect is that if you're, because you're, when you get, I move them frequently because that way, if you put them in a smaller area, they do a better job. They don't, because if you put them in a large area, they're going to be picky. Mm -hmm. And if you put them in a small area, they're able to do a better job of Doing, managing that vegetation, depending on what the objectives are again. But, and then you're also maintaining their nutrition at a higher level because you're moving them, because they, you know, have to, since they get in that, the nutrition is dropping on that piece. It's, but you're moving them every three days, the nutrition goes back up. So you're, you help them maintain that quality of that vegetation. So you're moving a lot of fences. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I have, well, 20, these have 25 rolls of, of that electric netting with me. And sometimes I use that much, sometimes I don't. Some projects I use that much, and they're 160 feet of roll. So some places I use all that netting, some places I don't. So. And I do it all I do it all myself. And do they know you? Like, oh. do they come to you at the end of the day? Or? Well, they, yeah, they know me. They, they get low on feet, they tell me. <laughs> <laughs> they, that's where they get noisy. Because you go out, they come by, I'll check it from a distance. Okay. Because in your urban area, they, get, they can get pretty obnoxious when they get, when they get low on feet. You know, this, it's like they're killing them, you know, they're dying. It's like, what are you doing with your goats? Oh, they're just getting, they're trying to clean up the last little bit, you know. So they get, they, but yeah, they, they know me. They, they see me up there in the low feet, boom, they're next to that fence going, hey, when are we going to move to the next pit? I see you out there working on that fence, hurry up! And they start talking. Do you have a mixture of male and female goats? Uh, well, uh, there's some wet, weathers in there, there's, uh, no, I don't kick the bucks out with. Uh, most of them are most of them are females, except for the this year's kids. Uh, there's a, there'll be males in there, and then I do have a few weathers that I, that I just kept over the years. So, but majority of them are females, but they're young. Dog? Yes, I do have a, two dogs. I have a border collie. That he's uh, uh, she not she. Uh, she helps me. Um, Nessie helps me round them up. I mean, that's her job. She's not doing much until I kind of load them. Or if they are situation they they get out, and it's like it's not you know people say oh did he ever get out? It's not if they'll get out, it's when they get out because <laughs> they will they will get out. I mean it's just it's impossible not to say in a situation where they're not going to get out. But uh, uh, but you try to manage that in, in areas. That's why you're there. You're monitoring that fence, especially in urban sites. You, you know the fence get knocked. Somebody's messing around in the fence. Maybe the ground is a little soft. Your fence get somebody knocks against the fence. And it gets knocked a little bit. And you're, if you're there, oh, you see it, and you get it, control it before it gets to be a bad situation. <laughs> so that's why you're there. Yeah, that's why I'm there all the time. Yeah. Do the goats spend the evening in the, in the trailer? No, they stay. They stay in the pen. Okay. Oh, yeah. And I, I know that we're getting close to the end of time. And you got to make sure you're getting uh, you're giving your evaluations. So I'm going to stay here if you want to ask more questions. I'm ready to stay here. So because you got 50 minutes for the next break. But, yeah. Do you market meat? meat? I, uh, I've done a little of that, yeah, I do sell, some of the goats get sold for meat, and I do sell, I mean, I sell uh, breeding stock as well, but I do sell, uh, I haven't done, uh, well, I, say, I shouldn't say I haven't, I've done, I tried to go into the, you know, processing and sell cuts and that kind of thing, that's a challenge, because, I mean, I've sold more direct, you know, more direct, you know, sell the animal itself, you know, for, for meat, uh, it's a little more challenging to get into the, I know there's, if you go down to the main market down here in Spokane, I think they, they occasionally have goat meat down there. Uh, it is a challenge because there's not, 
I mean, it's good, good lean meat. There's a lot of positive things about goat meat, but it's, it's more of an ethnic, you know, it's not too much of a, I mean, people are looking, you know, they're looking at grass-fed beef, but it's actually, goat, if you're looking at goat, it's actually better than grass-fed meat as far as lean and value of fat. But people say, oh, and it's, if you have a good cut, you're probably not going to have, if you have, I mean, people say, oh, it has, you know, strong flavor, but I bet I can do a roast and people couldn't tell the difference between that and beef. I mean, you have to be careful how you cook it. Because one of the things about, about to go is that it's lean. In fact, it doesn't marble. It doesn't have marble ink, so it, all the fat's on the exterior. So it, it can dry it out real easy. And if it's tough, you can dry it out. You know? okay. so I have to go with really bad. Well, you got to figure out how to cook it with moisture or exceed that moisture inside that meat. But it, that's been a challenging aspect, I know. But I, that, again, that's the marketing side of it. That, that's not an area that I'm really excited and interested in, so I don't spend time on it. <laughs> I like to go, I like to, I talk about vegetation, I do that stuff. So my wife is going to do a little work on that, but she's got other things she's doing. So we haven't spent much time on the meat side of it. But, uh, that's a, a niche that is out there, definitely out there. There's more, get, there's more, we don't probably, in the U.S. we probably fit, produce less than 50% of the goat that's consumed in the United States. It's most of it's important. I mean, half, over half of it's important from New Zealand or Australia. So. And the five minutes a day that you spend on the road, does that fund the rest of the year? Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I make, on the vegetation side of it, it grows, I probably make $120,000, $130,000 a year. About. I, I haven't. Uh, I do mostly trace minerals. Is probably that's the only thing I take with me. Um, rare occasion, you got to watch. I know there was a friend of mine who was good. He was doing some. They're getting more interested in doing some of the retention, the stormwater retention ponds, and some of those. And then where there's more uh, cattails and some other things that are there that don't have a high quality feed. And he had. He, so when you depending on the type of project you might want to have to monitor that and make sure whether or not because he did he was he called me and asked some questions and said well you might have to because uh, he didn't think it go for a single one so he, he supplemented with some uh, alpha pellets or something like that. so you do have to monitor that and 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 one of the things if if you don't if you just want to do weed management project the ideal animal to have is just a, a wet you know capsule of male so that way. He has no other nutritional requirements. He's just going to eat for He's just maintaining it for himself. Whether or not have a doe on there with kids and boosting milk. I have does with kids on there. But they, they're, I mean, I've selected for one to do okay on that. Yeah, kind of environment. Yeah. 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 Y